Lord, may we hear the invitation of the angels today. May we be reminded that you are the one who brings hope and joy and peace and all that our hearts long for. And as we're gathered today in this place, with some here in this room, some in the family worship venue, some online, but Lord, we're gathered together as your people. Will you meet us in this time? May we hear your message. May we get a fresh perspective, a fresh outlook on this glorious truth and reality that you, God Almighty, entered human history to encounter us and to bring your grace. Meet us in this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, if you want to see something with clarity, if you really want to see something, you can't just look at it from one angle, from one perspective. Whether it's a person or a concept or a thing, we can't just be monodimensional and just look from one, one, one perspective and think we're going to get the whole picture. We've got to look at something kind of from over here and from over here and around this side and up above and turn it around and, and really examine it to see it. And that's what we're doing here at Christmas time. We're talking about perspectives on Christmas, how we need to have varied perspectives to get the big picture. I had a, a pretty amazing reminder of, of the value and the importance of, of different perspectives, looking at the different facets of something. Uh, when my wife Sherry this last year had a chance to go down to Los Angeles to a wedding of a friend of the family, and she went down for the wedding, spent two days down there, came back home, and after traveling and being part of that and coming all the way home, she described to me she got all the way home, got the car unpacked, got everything put away. It was evening, finishing her day, ready to go to bed, walked into our bedroom, closed the door, kind of leaned against the door, and just said a prayer, Lord, thank you for safe travels. Thank you for bringing me home. Thank you for a great time. She finished her prayer. She opened her eyes. She looked on her left hand where her wedding ring was that normally had a diamond in it. There was no diamond. The diamond that had been there for 35 years, 36 years since we were engaged was gone. We looked, tried to find it. It didn't turn up. So my wife said to me, it's okay, it was a beautiful diamond I had for 35 years, I'm okay, I don't really need, she had, had a diamond passed on for a family member, and she had, this, this, will be, this will be okay, she says, don't worry about it. But a short time after that, getting near our 35th anniversary, I kind of went and snuck away and went to a, this wonderful jeweler in the Bay Area, and for the second time in my life, found myself shopping for a diamond. It's only been twice now. And so I went and shopped and looked, and so in this diamond shop, this, this jeweler, who just loved what he did, did a wonderful job. He showed me these different diamonds. And when you just look at them from one angle, looking in the case, you go, oh, that's pretty, that's nice. But a jeweler knows that's not how you're supposed to look at a diamond. So he has these like little jeweler tweezer things. I don't know the official technical term, but like these locking tweezers that grab a diamond and he'd bring it up and he'd take it, hold it up to the light and slowly turn it. Give all the perspectives, see all the facets. And it just explodes with beauty, different than just looking from one perspective, getting the whole picture. Then I looked at the price tag, didn't buy anything because Sherry said I didn't have to. Uh, <clears throat> no, I would be telling the story if that's what I did. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so for the second time in my life, I bought a diamond. And I got a chance to surprise Sherry with that diamond as kind of part of our 35th anniversary celebration. And I told my wife, I will buy her another diamond in 35 years at our 70th anniversary. And so she's looking forward to that. She's got that ahead for her. But, but the, the, it just reminded me as this jeweler turned this diamond in the light that the whole beauty comes alive. What we're doing this Christmas season is we're looking at Jesus, the, the most rare, beautiful, precious being in the history of the world, the most beautiful person to ever grace this world with his presence. And we're sort of turning around that diamond and looking at Jesus from different perspectives. We've looked at him from the perspective of Mary, who sees Jesus in the story one way. We've looked from the perspective of Joseph. We've looked from the perspective of the shepherds. We've looked from the perspective of the wise men. All these different perspectives. And it starts to form this beautiful picture for us this Christmas season. But today, we're going to look at this beautiful diamond of Jesus from above. And we're going to look at it from the perspective of the heavenly messengers, the heavenly beings, angels. Do you think that angels have a unique perspective on who Jesus is? What do you think? I mean, th these are heavenly messengers, heavenly warriors who live in the very presence of God Almighty. And they see Jesus and his radiance and his glory. I cannot imagine, this is how my brain works, try to imagine the conversations the angels had with each other 
When they heard that God Almighty, the second person of the Trinity, the eternal Son of God, was going to leave the glory of heaven and be born in human flesh. Can you imagine the angels going, what? How's that work? Why would he, you know, and, and yet, yet they got to come and tell us, tell Mary and Joseph and the shepherds who this Jesus was. So today, we get this perspective, this heavenly messenger perspective on who Jesus is. We're going to look at three passages from the Gospels. We're going we're to start in Luke chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 2. Then we'll go back to Matthew, and then we'll come back to the Gospel of Luke. And we're going to look at three passages. I want to ask you just to pay attention to what these angels say. What are they saying about this Jesus? Because they give us a unique perspective, a unique outlook that we would never have on our own, that we couldn't, we couldn't figure this out on our own. And as you're turning to Luke chapter two, I'll ask you a question or ask you to imagine something. Imagine how you might respond to an encounter with an angelic being from heaven. I mean, how how would you respond? Because we get to see how Mary and Joseph and the shepherds responded. I mean, how would you respond if this glorious, magnificent, heavenly being messenger were just to show up in the middle of your work day at school in 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 the dark and the quiet of the evening if God sent a messenger to show up. People got to experience this. How would you respond? And, and don't, don't respond. I'd be fine. No big deal. Because everybody who encountered an angel, and we don't know exactly what angels looked like, but, but I mean, there's a sense that they were radiant and magnificent and powerful and, and to the point where everyone who saw them would just be frozen in terror and fear because of their glory and their magnificence. To the point where every angel... Day one of angel training school was training how you greet a human being. And it's always this way, fear not. Because when human beings encounter angels, it's just like, whoa. And and so as we look at these three passages, let God speak to you. And hear what he has to say. Turn with me to Luke, in Luke chapter one. We're gonna begin in verse 26. We're gonna look at Mary's encounter. In her case, it's with a specific angel. It's with Gabriel, one of the chief angels. And Gabriel is sent from the throne room of heaven to bring a message to Mary. Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Put your finger right there if you have your Bible open. Just, just, just hold on right there for a minute. Now we have to understand in the ancient world, Pledged to be married meant something different than now. When a person, it was sort of like the first step in this agreement. And so it was sort of an engagement of pledging to be married, but they weren't married yet. But it was a very serious thing. You didn't just break off an engagement. It was a big deal. And so so so, so she's pledged to be married to Joseph. They're not married yet. They haven't consummated that relationship physically, intimately, because they're not married. But there's there's this covenantal agreement that they are going to be married. All right? The virgin's name was Mary. Verse 28. The angel, Gabriel, went to her and said, Greetings you who are highly favored. I love that term. We're going to talk about that. Greetings you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God, and you will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. The name Jesus actually means God is salvation. That's what his name means. God is salvation. It's a derivative from the Old Testament Hebrew word uh, named Joshua. But Jesus means God is salvation. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. Notice those words. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word, be, may your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. Wow. A lot there. A lot in that encounter. Here's the question. 
What might the heavenly messengers, uh, what, 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 what the heavenly messengers, what might they say to us? What would Gabriel say to us? It, what Gabriel said to Mary, what the angels said to the different people, really was for all of us. So look at this encounter, and, and you might I notice some other things. Let me share three things, and then kind of a bonus thing that I think that, that the angel, that, that Gabriel would say to us if he encountered us. Here's the first one. You are favored by God. You are favored. This wasn't just for Mary. Yes, she, she would bear the Son of God. She was favored in a unique way. But can you imagine from the perspective of the angels, the angels who, who would dwelt in the very presence and were messengers of the living God, one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for them to understand that, that God the Son would come and walk among us and give himself for us and love us, you are favored by God beyond your wildest imagination. And the angels knew that, that God was showing his favor to his children. I think the heavenly messengers might tell us this, that this Jesus, he is the son of the most high. This Jesus is the son of the most high God. This baby, this infant, needing to be fed and needing to be changed this, this baby in the manger is the son of, the, of God Almighty, the son of the only father. So how do you comprehend that? How do you comprehend God, the second person of the Trinity, coming and dwelling among us, born in a manger, born with hunger pains, needing to be protected and cared for? I had the chance going through my education to go through two of the, the best Christian colleges in the country, two great colleges. I had a chance to go to one of the top seminaries in the country for three years. I did a five-year doctoral program. And if you said to me, explain to me how God Almighty, the Son of God, comes to live in a human baby. With all my years of education, here's what I would say to you. I have no idea. I, I, I can't comprehend. And yet somehow in the mystery of, of God's power and glory, this child born in Bethlehem was the son of the living God and the second person of the Trinity. We believe in one God, one God who exists eternally in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And this one in the manger was God with us. And the angels would say, you have to understand, this is the son of the most high. I think the angels would also tell us this. He will rule forever. This child born in Bethlehem, he is the one who has ruled forever, who rules now, and who will rule forevermore. This Jesus Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the ruler of all nations. And, and you know, as you walk through life and you're like, you know, oh gosh, I'm worried about you know, who's, who's on the throne in this country and who's in charge of this country and who's, who sits in this office or sits in this chair or this place of authority. We should care about those things. We should strive for the best things for our world. But at the end of the day, our peace and our confidence comes because Jesus Christ is the King of kings and Lord of lords and he's on the throne. Someone say amen. amen. I mean, and so when things get crazy in our world, and they get crazy in our world sometimes, we know who's on the throne. And when, when time ends, every kingdom and every king and every ruler will bow their knees before Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we know that, amen? And that's... And, and, so, and so the angels say, because they know who this is, they say, he will rule forever and his kingdom will never end. And all we can say is amen, praise God. Let me give you one bonus one from Gabriel's sharing with Mary. That God's word always holds up and never fails. I think that Gabriel would say to us, understand something, God's word, God's truth, what God speaks, it will always come to be. It will always pass. It might not be in my timing. It almost never is. <laughs> There's times where I think I sort of know what God should do and kind of how he should do it in his timetable, and, and sometimes I'll mention it to God. Um, you ever do that? You ever explain to God what would work out nicely for you, right? And God doesn't always cooperate with me. But I know this, his word never fails. And what he declares is always true. And can I give a little kind of culturally relevant, church culturally relevant side note? When you hear individuals or churches decide that they're going to declare what God should do, and God hasn't said he's going to do that, be careful. Be careful. 
And some of you may be tuned to this, some may not be. There's a church right now that's been declaring what God is going to do and a certain thing that happened in their church and it's something that God doesn't promise he's gonna do for everybody. And, and, and it's, it's not something beyond God's power, but it's something that God doesn't promise. And, there's people, and, and it makes Jesus look bad and the church look bad. When we declare things that God is supposed to do and God hasn't declared he's gonna do them. God always is true to his word and fulfills what he promises, but we have to be careful we don't claim or name a promise that God didn't make and then make God look bad for not answering a promise he never made. Does everybody follow me on that? So just be careful when you decide to declare or other people declare what God has to do or what they say God's going to do. God's word always holds up and it never fails. Just make sure we're holding to God's word. Let's continue on through the gospels. Now go to, back to the gospel of Matthew. And let's look at Joseph's encounter. So Joseph had his own angelic encounter. And as you listen to this passage, Matthew 1, 18 to 25, as you listen to this, as you follow along in your Bibles or in your iPads or on the screen, uh, try to notice what do you think that, that the angels would say to us in relation to what they said to Joseph, all right? Verse 18, Matthew chapter one. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, and that means her betrothed, they weren't married yet, but because Joseph, her husband, her betrothed, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. That meant to break off the engagement, all right? Excuse me. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Remember, his name is God is salvation. He will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. And this is through the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 7. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. What the heavenly messengers might tell us, what do you think these angelic beings would tell us in a way that they spoke to Joseph? Here's a few thoughts. Pay attention to your dreams. Pay attention to your dreams. Because God speaks in different ways. And if God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and if God spoke in dreams then, God can speak in dreams now. Now, a dream doesn't over, take over what the Word of God says, what the Bible says, but there's times through a dream he might guide or nudge or direct you. Now, sometimes you have a strange dream is because you had too many jalapenos and habaneros the night before. And so don't try to, you know, don't give God credit for everything you happen to dream, but pay attention. Because God might be speaking to you, might be nudging you in some direction. So be open and pay attention. What the heavenly messengers might tell us. Don't be afraid when God is moving and speaking. Don't be afraid. When you know God is leading you, prompting you, guiding you, directing you, follow with confidence even when you're nervous. Follow in confidence because when God is leading, when God is moving, when God is speaking, we can have confidence in what he's going to do. And I was thinking about that different times for Sherry and I where we've known God was leading us but it was still kind of scary. Do you know what I'm talking about? There's times where you go, I know the Lord's leading me here or calling me to do this, but I'm still kind of nervous about it. How do I handle that? I need to get, put my trust in God. I think of when God called us to leave West Michigan and move back to California. I was born and raised in Southern California. Sherry was born and raised in West Michigan. When we got married, we were in California for a number of years and to a ministry here. God called us to West Michigan. We were there for 20 years. And we loved where we were. We loved the ministry we were doing. As a matter of fact, in Michigan, we had a home Brace yourself for this. We had a home in West Michigan and we had paid for it. That's not even legal in California. Um, I mean, you're not allowed to pay off your house. No, but, but it, is, it is legal here. It's just really hard. <laughs> but we had paid, we, we, our house was paid off and we loved where we were. And God, through a whole series of things, led us to come and be part of Shoreline Church, a church that we love, that's become our home. But when we were called, it was kind of scary. And our boys at the time were going to school. All of them were, they were, they were going to school in Michigan, in Chicago, in Los Angeles. And we kind of figured, and both Sherry and I basically took our kids and we placed them on the Lord's hands. We placed them on the altar. We said, okay, Lord, they're yours. 
because they may migrate back to Michigan, they may go somewhere else, but it's very unlikely they're going to move to Monterey, California, because it's just, I don't have to tell you, it's hard to live, it's expensive to live here. It's hard to live here. So we figured our boys would never live here. So Sharon and I talked and prayed, and we said, okay, our boys will never live with us, our grandkids never be near us, we'll get to go visit them occasionally, but that's the Lord's call. And it was scary, but we knew we were being led, so we walked into that. And then God, by his grace, got to surprise us. As a matter of fact, our oldest son, Zach, was the first one to come and visit Monterey, and he hung around for a while, spent some time here, and he met this young woman named Christine, who actually worked at Shoreline Church. She was doing, she was our coordinator of hospitality. She did the Sunday morning breakfast and all the food stuff for Shoreline. She was on staff doing that. Our son, Zach, met her, and they got married, and they stayed here. And then she actually got a different job, so that job opened up. We hired a new person named Taylor, and Taylor started working in that same position, and our second son, Josh, came and visited. (laughs) You're ahead of me, aren't you? (laughs) And Josh came to visit, and he met Taylor over time. And they're now married. So I thought, if we ever hire a third person, uh, we got three boys. But, but Taylor's, Taylor's still doing that job. She, she wasn't a Harney when, when we came here, but she married one of our sons. But then our third son, Nate, came here. And he's married to Bryn, who was just up here singing, and she's one of our worship leaders. So all three of our boys married young women that were on staff at Shoreline. Are we following that story? When we left to come here, we were nervous, we were afraid, it was scary, but we followed. We didn't know that God was going ahead of us to prepare all of that. How could we, right? But when God's moving and he calls you to follow and you're afraid, keep following. Don't let your fear get in the way. It also helped that I actually made all the young women under 25 at Shoreline write a contract saying they'd marry one of my sons. But that was not, um, no, I, did, I didn't do that. I couldn't do that. I checked with California state law. That's not legal either. Uh, but no, I didn't. But, but what a gift from the Lord, right? When God's moving, when God's speaking, guiding, don't be afraid. I think that the heavenly messenger would also tell us this, that God's on the move. God is moving. God is working. The God we gather to worship today is not a passive God who kind of got the universe going and said, have a nice eternity. That's not the God we worship. He is present. He's moving. He's in your lives. He's more active than you realize. Pay attention. I think the angels would say, oh, you don't even know all that God is doing. But when he's moving, when he's guiding, follow him. And then one more thing. The heavenly messengers would tell us he is Jesus, the Savior. He is the solution. He is the one who saves us from our sins. There is a way that every human being on this planet can have their sins washed away by putting their faith in Jesus. And he's available to everyone. Not everyone gets Jesus, not that they aren't offered him, but some choose not to receive him. But he is the solution to the sin problem. There's a God who loves us, but we are separate from that God because of our thoughts, our words, our actions that are against him, and our sin separates us. And Jesus came to bring us back in fellowship with the Father. He took our sins on the cross. He bore our shame. He took our punishment and he died in our place. And three days later, he rose again. And he offers that salvation to anyone and everyone who will receive it. Everyone who receives him. He calls them, he calls them his children. And the angels know this. So they say, he is the savior. He is Jesus. God is salvation. And the angels would declare that to you and declare that to me. And then one more angelic encounter. Turn with me to Luke chapter two. So back to the gospel of Luke, the second chapter. And now we see the angels encountering the shepherds. And again, pay attention to the angels, what they say, because what they would say then is still true today. Pay attention to what God wants to say to you. Luke chapter two, beginning in verse eight. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them. Just one angel. And the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. That's just one angel. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, now it gets big. (laughs) Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host of angelic beings appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. And when the angels had left them and had gone into heaven, 
the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. What the heavenly messengers might tell us, if we look at what they said to the shepherds, we can hear that message come alive for our hearts today. I think the heavenly messengers would tell us this. He brings good news of great joy. When you know Jesus, when you walk with Jesus, and some of you know him and love him, some of you are not yet there, but when you know Jesus, the closer you walk to him, the more you experience his good news and the more you experience his great joy. Here's what I've experienced. When I start to wander, when I'm not walking close to Jesus, the less I experience the good news of Jesus, the more my attitude changes and the less I experience the greatness of his joy. And he hasn't moved. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's when I wander away. But when I draw closer to Jesus, that good news, that great joy that's there for all people, I experience that. And draw near to Jesus. Walk in the good news, the gospel of Jesus, and the joy that comes through Jesus. What the heavenly messengers might tell us, I think it would tell us this. He is for everyone. They know that the death of Jesus Christ would pay the price for all sins of everyone who would receive that gift. So they could say, it's good, it's good news for all the people, the wealthy and the poor, men and women, people of every tribe, tongue, nation, and people. The book of Revelation talks about every tribe, tongue, nation, people. They'll all be invited in through Jesus. He is for everyone. Who should you pray for to know Jesus? Everyone. Why? He's for everyone. Who should you share your, your journey of faith with and the good news of Jesus with? Everyone. Why? Because he's for everyone. I think the heavenly messengers would tell us this, that he is the Messiah. He is the Lord. The Lord of all. The king over all kings. Revelation says the ruler of the kings of the earth. And there will come a day when every tongue will declare, every knee bow and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every person. Those who've named his name and those who haven't because when we come to his presence, we'll fall on our faces. Some will worship out of willing worship because they've come to know Jesus. Some will just fall on their faces not because they want to but because he is Lord. He is Messiah. He is the king of all kings. And the, the, the angels will remind us of that. And I think the angels would also remind us of this. If there will ever be peace on earth, it will be through Jesus. If there's ever gonna be peace on this earth, if there's ever gonna be peace in a nation, it will be the work of Jesus. If there's ever gonna be a peace in a neighborhood or a workplace or on a school campus, it's gonna be the presence of Jesus. If there's ever gonna be peace in a marriage or a family, it will be Jesus. And if there's ever gonna be peace in your heart, it will be Jesus. He is the Prince of Peace. He brings his peace and offers his peace. And here's a question for each one of us. When we walk in the room, if you're a follower of Jesus, if the spirit of the Messiah, the living Jesus Christ lives in you, when you walk in a room, do people say, hey, peace just walked in, man. When she comes into a room, there's just a sense of peace. When he walks in, people just get along. Is that what you bring? Some of you are going to be around a, a table at Christmas time. And it might be peaceful. It might not be so peaceful. But here's the question. What are you going to bring to the table? Do you bring the peace of Jesus? I'm not saying everybody agrees on everything. We don't. But Jesus is the bringer of peace. And as I was thinking about this, I did a quick study and a quick search. Right now on planet Earth, there are 37 known wars going on or armed armed conflicts or wars on our globe right now. And another 17 what are called skirmishes, which means there's battles going on, but then it's not quite declared a war yet. 54 battlegrounds on planet Earth. A lot of those places we don't even know and we may not even be able to pronounce the name of the country. But what I see when I look at how human beings are doing it, bringing peace to Earth, I don't think we got it nailed down yet. I don't think we got it figured out. But this Jesus is the Prince of Peace, the source of peace. And you walk with him and you bear that peace. There's, a, there's an old song we used to sing in, in church, let there be peace on earth. And it goes, and let it begin with me. So you want somebody else to declare peace and make it happen. But it begins with us. And, you, and that, it comes in us when we walk in the peace of Jesus. 
So will you be a peacemaker and seek to bring peace wherever you can? Not saying you don't stand for what you believe in, but saying you bear peace. One more question. What the heavenly messengers might ask us. What might the heavenly messengers ask us if they were here right now? If, 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 a, if the angel Gabriel or Michael or one of the heavenly beings was here, what might they ask us? Just listen to these questions. And in your own heart, just try to kind of come up with an answer right now before God, just between you and God. Here's the first question. Do you realize that God favors you? Before the Lord right now, do you realize that God Almighty left heaven and was born in a manger to build a bridge for you to come back to the Father? He greatly favors you. Do you know that? Next question. I think the angels would ask us this. Why are you afraid? What's making you afraid right now? Why are you afraid? If you know who wins at the end of all of this, if you know who the King of Kings and Lord of Lords is, why walk in fear? It doesn't mean there aren't challenges in life. It doesn't mean there aren't legitimate things to, to work through. But at the end of the day, if you say, I know he's on the throne. I know he's on the throne of my life. I know I belong to him. I know heaven is my home. I know my sins are washed away. Man, that changes your perspective. Don't walk, don't live in fear. I think they also might ask us this. Do you walk in the peace of Jesus? If you bear the name of Jesus, if you say, I am a Christian, if you bear the name of Jesus, do you bear the peace of Jesus? Do you walk in his peace? Do you, bring your, do you bring the peace of Jesus everywhere you go? And when the people closest to you say, oh, she's a, she brings peace. Oh, he brings peace. Or they say, not so much. Are you one who bears the peace of Jesus? I think the angels would ask us this. Do you want good news and joy and peace in your life? Is that what you long for? And if you know Jesus, walk more closely with him and you'll find that more and more. And if you don't yet know Jesus, his arms are open. He invites you to come to him. He brings good news and joy and peace. Which leads to the next question I believe the angels would ask us. Have you embraced Jesus as Savior, Lord, and Messiah? The angels of heaven know that he is Savior, that he is the way, that he is the Lord, he is the anointed one, the Messiah. They know that. And the angels of heaven know that that's the way to come home to the Father. I think I would say, have you embraced the Savior? And if you haven't this Christmas season, if you haven't yet done that, talk with me after the service. Talk with one of our pastors. Talk, we've got, I think Pastor Keith will be in the, in the connection. So we have pastors around our campus. Find a pastor and just say, I want to know how you go about knowing this Jesus. If you haven't embraced him yet, I think the angels would say, you've got to know who this is. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is salvation. And one last question. What is holding you back? What's getting in the way? What keeps you from running to the arms of Jesus? And whatever it is, push it aside this Christmas and run to him. Before I pray, just one more question. Will you open your ears and eyes to a fresh understanding of Jesus? This Christmas, will you say, God, I want this fresh perspective, this heavenly perspective from these heavenly messengers. Give me a fresh perspective on who Jesus is. And Jesus, that's our prayer today. We join our hearts together in prayer. And we ask that we would have a fresh way of hearing and seeing and understanding, Jesus, who you are. That if we're limited in our perspective, that we would get this new outlook. And, and even now as we pray, I want to invite you as I lead in prayer right now, as we close in prayer, would you be willing to pray these prayers, declaring to God what the angels have promised us or told us? Would you say, God, help me know that I am favored by you. Would you say that prayer to God today? God, help me know that I am favored, that you left the glory of heaven. You were born in this world. You took my sins on the cross. You suffered and died for me. And you rose again. You offer me salvation. I am favored. And if I've received it, oh God, what a blessing you've given me. Thank you for your favor in my life. Would you be willing to pray to God and say, God, help me be able to declare, I will not walk in fear. God, I don't want to walk in fear and live in fear and anxiety and worry, but I want to know who you are and what you've done and that I'm never alone. And that God, when all this world comes to a close, you're on the throne. I know how the story ends. Lord, help me not walk in fear. Will you pray this prayer? God, I will let Jesus rule my life. I will let him be Lord and Messiah and leader over all things. Jesus, I will surrender my life to you. 
I'm not gonna do everything my way. I wanna walk in your ways, even when it's a little scary, and see the wonderful things you'll do. Will you pray to God right now? God, when you move and you call me to move, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to follow you into new ways of serving and new ways of loving. I'm ready to follow you in turning from wrong ways of living. I'm ready to follow you wherever you call, whatever you call me to do. God, I want to follow you. I want to trust you at that level. Will you pray to God and say, God, I want to bear and carry your good news and joy and peace everywhere I go. Make me a person of good news and joy and peace. When I walk in a room, oh Lord, may people know that good news and joy and peace are coming with me because I come in the name of Jesus and I come filled with the spirit of Jesus. Lord, let that mark my life. And will you pray today? I will embrace Jesus this day either for the first time or tighter than I ever have before. But I will wrap my arms and my heart around Jesus and follow him and love him and live for him. Jesus, this is our prayer today, that we would be people who understand this Christmas story. Not just a baby in a manger, but the Lord of glory come to earth. Let this fresh, heavenly, angelic perspective give us a new vision of what Christmas is all about. And be glorified in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen.